sort of stereotypical loners that are sort of on the periphery of, of society. If you look at the traditional um, peoples who were accused of being witches uh, in Europe uh, and in America, uh, generally it's a woman uh, because women were considered weaker vessels than men, more willing to be ensnared by uh, the wiles of the devil. Uh, often it was a lower class individual. Uh, very often it was one who was not a church member, one who had some kind of uh, uh, reason for not being the upright citizen and therefore the, uh, the one that would be easier prey for a witchcraft hunt. The afflicted girls, among them, of course, uh, Elizabeth Paris, Betty Paris, and uh, Abigail Williams, and uh, Ann Putnam Jr., and others, they cry out against a great number of people, uh, people not just in the Salem area, but as far away as Andover, um, at, at some distance. During these times, it became increasingly important for ministers to provide answers to these troubled communities. If this is happening in your congregation, in Salem or Beverly or Salem Village or Andover, uh, this becomes something that you have to address. You're the minister. You're one of the most important people in the community, and the devil is theoretically attacking your congregation and your religion, and therefore you've got to be able to stand up against it. And when this often happens, it's human nature for people to perhaps go a little bit too far. And I think Hale uh, fell into that, as did Paris, as did Noyes. In fairness uh, to most ministers of that time, Hale was an, a not an unusual person in that respect, as he felt that, uh, in his opinion, the Bible supported uh, evidence that, that witches existed. During the 17th century, belief in the existence of witchcraft was commonplace. He again goes back to the beginning with the general belief in the powers of darkness, which was very general among both the learned and, and the unlearned at that at that time, that Satan was was were definitely present and was trying to undo what had been done and setting up the the pious colony in Massachusetts. As Cotton Mather said, he chose Salem because Salem was the firstborn of their, of their New England settlements in the New World. One of the biggest events that influenced how the uh, trials would proceed in Salem in 1692 was the overthrow of Governor Andros. Before 1692, there was roughly a three-year period where Massachusetts did not have a charter. It was known as the inner charter period. What that did was it reverted the legal structure of Massachusetts for roughly a two, two and a half year period back to the legal structure that was established from the 1629 charter um, given to them by Charles I. During this time, magistrates were allowed to maintain local jurisdiction but they suspended all capital matters, matters of treason, until the new governor, Sir William Phipps, arrived with the new charter. Acting as if the magistrates were under the rules of the 1629 charter, they accepted complaints and began to investigate. You initially would have a complaint sworn out to a, a deputy uh, or a member of the court of assistants who lived in that county. Then that deputy would in turn uh, investigate. And in Salem you had that. Whether or not that part was legal at the time is still under question because there was no charter. Regardless of that, you had the examination. The examinations are, are carried on. Names are given by the afflicted girls. Uh, Hale, of course, is very much a part of the, in, uh, of the uh, inquiries in that time. They wanted them to confess, I am a witch and I am sorry. Depositions back in the 17th century were not the kind of things that you might think um, in a trial today uh, people would be able to give. You gave opinions, you gave uh, secondhand testimony, you gave hearsay testimony. It was supposed to be kind of weighed for its value. 
Uh, but in many cases, because witchcraft was such a hard um, crime to be able to prove, it was allowed by magistrates. When people read about or see movies about the Salem witchcraft and they hear some of the witches, accused witches, uh, giving their testimony, what they're hearing are the preliminary hearings. Uh, these were hearings that magistrates would um, go to after a warrant, w after a complaint was sworn against someone for being a witch. Uh, they would arrest the person, bring them in, and then hear for probable cause. And all of those wonderful uh, testimonies of Rebecca Nurse or uh, Martha Corey or any of the other uh, accused witches are usually these uh, preliminary hearings. And uh, ultimately, uh, people are brought in for examination. Ultimately, they are brought in for trial. And uh, as we all know, the trials really by, by June by May and June of 1692, the trials uh, really get vigorously underway, and Hale is very much a part of that. Hale offered depositions against three of his parishioners, only one of whom was to be tried for witchcraft. And what you find in the whole history of Salem witchcraft is that those ministers whose congregations were affected and who lived in and around afflicted children and who saw these things on almost a daily basis were very much more involved in it. The minister was uh, a very strong person in the community. They were the teacher, they were the minister, they were essentially the judge and jury for, for most activities that were going on. And if they came down for or against a parishioner, uh, there wasn't much other recourse that the, uh, the parishioner could do. Despite the fact that there was no legal body to hear cases of witchcraft, the magistrates issued arrest warrants. On May 15, 1692, Sir William Phipps and Increase Mather sailed into Boston Harbor with a new charter. By this time, there was a backlog of nearly 50 people who had been arrested and awaited trial. Within a few days, Phipps put together six members of his advisory council as a special court of Oyer and Terminer. As chief justice of this court, Phipps named his lieutenant governor, William Stoughton. The first of the 1692 trials was the trial of Bridget Bishop. There are about 10 um, depositions against her. Some of them, if they weren't so serious, would be very amusing. Historians have been critical of the condemning testimony offered against Bridget Bishop. Charles Upham was among them and stated that the testimony offered by Reverend John Hale against Bridget Bishop demands criticism. Later historians like David Green, Richard Trask, and Marguerite Harris have discovered that Hale, in fact, did not offer a testimony against Bridget Bishop. Reverend Hale did a deposition against Sarah Bishop fairly early, uh, before the witchcraft uh, you know, hysteria really became big. And then uh, later, uh, uh, Bridget Bishop was in a different parish, so he would have had no reason to testify against her. I guess Hale, like many of us, sometimes forgets people's names. And when he wrote it down, he just said Goody Bishop, and everybody assumed it was uh, Bridget Bishop. I have been to the library <coughs> in Salem, and I have seen the original of Hale and against Bridget. And in a crease in the paper, which the librarian carefully brought out, gloved hands, holding it, telling me to keep my hands down. He opened the crease just a little bit, and it was Sarah Bishop. It had Bridget Bishop's name written on the outside, but the deposition on the inside was against Sarah Bishop. Even a 1938 transcription of the Witchcraft Papers by the Works Progress Administration erroneously places Hale's testimony of Sarah Bishop in a list of depositions against Bridget Bishop. When the 
the WPA copied this book, copied the um, depositions in making the book. They were told not to disturb anything. And so they did not move the crease. And they read it and put it in Bridget's column. The deposition was attributed to the wrong person because Bridget Bishop was the, was the one that was accused of being a witch. Uh, Sarah Bishop never went on trial as a witch. By September, uh, 19 individuals have been hanged and uh, well over 200 people have been cried out against and over 52 people have been tried. There's, there's been a tremendous, um, just a tremendous outpouring of, uh, of uh, zeal against these individuals and unfortunately many innocent people lose their lives. But what they all shared in common was the fact that when they were confronted with the, the greatest crisis in their life, instead of doing what 40 others did, which was confessing and living for a period of time, and in fact, historically we know now that they, they lived and never went to trial, uh, these people said, damn it, I'm not a witch. I'm not going to go under the pressure of society, my family, religion, uh, political opinion. I'm just not going to do it. And, uh, and they were tried and executed, and they almost all knew that this was going to be the result of what they did. Gradually, as the, uh, as the trials progress, they begin to accuse more and more influential people, people of prominence, people of property, um, to the point where they begin to accuse individuals at the very top of New England society. And then finally, they work their way right up to the very top, and they start accusing individuals who are ministers' wives and governors' wives, like Governor Phipps's wife is accused, and uh, not the least of which, of course, is uh, uh, Philip and Mary English, two wealthiest people in Salem, and, and of course, the wife of Reverend John Hale. In November, Mary Herrick of Wenham, supposedly influenced by Dorcas Hoare, reported to her minister, Reverend Garrish, that she had been visited by the ghost of Mary Esty on the ladder of the gallows, who assured Mary Herrick that she would come no more after Sarah Noyes Hale was accused of witchcraft. She had been such a perfect minister's wife and so caring about the neighborhood and the, uh, the town and the minister that nobody believed it. He reflects on that, and he feels uh, most obviously that, number one, his wife is innocent, that uh, if one innocent person could be accused, like his wife, perhaps others have been, that perhaps we've been too rash, too caught up in the hysteria, too caught up in the, the tumult of this event to think clearly and rationally, and maybe we need to rethink our position. Well, the idea that, um Reverend Hale's wife being accused and Governor Phipps's wife being accused brought about the end of the witchcraft is one of those popular fantasies that really don't have historic merit. Uh, those people's names were being bantied about, but it was after October, and by then the court had, had fallen. Um, it probably helped, but it wasn't the thing that brought down the court. What did bring down the court was the disregard of spectral evidence in the new court established by Governor Phipps. And when that was no longer allowed, and when the new Governor William Phipps decided that uh, the court was going to be changed somewhat, um, it, it just collapsed. The special court of Oyer and Terminer was terminated and reconvened in Boston. Governor Phipps set up a regular tribunal called the Superior Court of Judicature, which consisted of many of the same people as the Court of Oyer and Terminer, including Chief Justice William Stoughton. They were barred, however, from using spectral evidence in their proceedings. After the Court of Oyer and Terminer, yes, you'll he have the continuation of these trials by the Court of Aziz throughout 1693, where they had to adjudicate the rest of these people who were arrested. Um, and in those cases, you do have, I believe, roughly five people found guilty of witchcraft, uh, but Governor Phipps will 
uh, will pardon them. So the executions end once the trial and the court of Orion Terminer uh, is uh, closed in, uh, in Salem and uh, removed to Boston. The, the witchcraft trials basically come to an end in the spring of 1693, uh, when everyone who is at that point being held in jail is let go. Phipps finally opened the doors and let all those go who were in the jail when they paid their rent. There were three left, and he pardoned them because he said they were no more guilty than the others. The Salem witchcraft trials have been a subject of study for over 300 years. Some theories have surfaced about what might have caused the mysterious behavior of the afflicted. Poisoning by ergo, a bacteria sometimes found on grain and known to cause hallucinations, is thought by some to have spread within the village. Another theory suggests that property became a coveted object between jealous neighbors, leading to false accusations. Some people have looked at the witchcraft accusations and have tried to find some kind of a conspiracy for trying to um, get rid of enemies or grab property. I think that's too simplistic. Uh, just like our society today is very complex, in the 17th century, their society was very complex, too. Historians and sociologists may never learn the motivations behind the accusations, but many agree that it makes for an important case study. I think you have to look at the Salem Witchcraft Trials as a transitional period um, in terms of its social um, reasons for it and causes. There are many great books written out there that focuses on this social transition. There's this religious transition as well that deals with the declining uh, power of the Puritan uh, clergy and Puritan members in Mass Bay from, again, the power that they had from 1629 to 1684 to this rapidly decreasing uh, influence that the church is having in terms of uh, law and uh, societal structure, if you will, that will occur shortly after 1692. They write books decrying Puritan clergy and saying that these men should not be leaders of our community. Look how wrong they were and look how bad their judgment was in this case and, and how, uh, how it should have been avoided, if at all possible, and if rational minds had been able to prevail. This whole episode, bad as it was, might not might have been entirely avoided. When the witchcraft was over, you, you had a void. What had happened? Uh, had we made mistakes? A lot of people started cropping up saying, yes, you made mistakes, and this shows how bad the government is, this shows how bad the ministerial class is. After the Salem witchcraft trials, the prestige and the power of the Puritan clergy that had once been so overwhelming throughout New England uh, is broken. There was you know, several apologies. There was the state, if you will, the general court's apology, uh, as well as individual apologies that came out afterwards. I have special reasons moving me to bear my testimony about these matters before I go hence and be no more. Reverend Hale had seen the error of, he felt, so many errors that they were were following the precedents that were set down by their fathers, and they were wrong. Now Hale, by this time, clearly has rethought his position, feels that he made a mistake, feels that many others also perhaps had been wrong in their judgments. And over the next four or five years, while he is still minister in Beverly, uh, begins to pull together the text of a book that has come now to be known as one of the great first-hand accounts of the Salem witchcraft trials. And many uh, ministers were afraid he would go too far the other way and deny the existence of witches, uh, that he didn't feel comfortable to publish it uh, in his own lifetime. Hale's uh, thesis was basically that the Puritans in New England had used imperfect principles in discovering who a witch was. 
that they had gone to tradition, to English tradition, to legal tradition, and by the touch test or by uh, the, the water test or by spectral evidence, they had used what were not religious Bible principles of understanding who or which was, uh, but English precedents. And he condemned that completely. I've been from my youth trained up in the knowledge and belief of most of those principles I hear questioned as unsafe to be used. His book really is a, uh, is kind of a how-to, uh, do it the right way, and pretty much of an apology of what had happened and what mistakes he and others had made uh, during it. A modest inquiry into the nature of witchcraft is not only an apology and a guide to examining witches, but it provides us with a true account of how those who were closely involved reacted to the hysteria. His book is an important one. It's a very important one to historians uh, because he talks about um, uh, the sincerity of these afflicted kids uh, and of the adults and that their afflictions seemed much more than play acting. Uh, they seemed supernatural. There is a biblical precedent for witchcraft and he wants to make it very clear that unlike many others he's not rejecting the existence of witchcraft and you have to understand that he never does. Uh, and that there are a number of cases, bona fide, absolutely, in his opinion, absolutely certain cases where people found guilty of witchcraft were justly executed. I have had a deep sense of the sad consequences of mistakes in matters, Capital, and their impossibility of recovering when completed, and what grief of heart it brings to a tender conscience to have been unwittingly encouraging the sufferings of the innocent. I think that that last statement is something that, that tells us a lot about, about John Hale. Hale lived for another three years after finishing his book. A Modest Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft was published posthumously in 1702. There is uh, evidence that the early part of May that year, that there had been a, a very severe storm of, of hail and wind and lightning and heaven knows what else that, that lasted for three days and really did a, did a huge amount of damage. And it seems to be the con consensus that John Hale had gone to Charlestown to, to ch uh, check on his property there. And had some, some sort of a seizure or stroke or whatever. He's buried over here in a parish cemetery. Him and two of his wives, I believe. In fact, the very last great thing he does is the publication of his book, A Modest Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft. And although scholars are certainly aware of the existence of this book, and I've included it in the course that I'm teaching in early American literature, because I think it's worth, it's worth noting, um, by and large, I think most teachers who study the Salem witchcraft trials don't deal with Hale um, as an important character, as an important figure. I currently work at Beverly High School as a U.S. history teacher. Um, and unfortunately, um, in Massachusetts, uh, U.S. history, you start at Reconstruction, post-Civil War, to the present. So I really don't have a chance to you know, dwell into colonial history. Um, though it does get taught through uh, AP history courses at 11th grade level. In fact, most students learn about the Salem witchcraft trials through literature in reading Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible. Miller's tale of the trials was written in the early 1950s during the comparable witch hunt hysteria of what later came to be called McCarthyism. I've been teaching at Belly High School for about 18 years, and I think I've been teaching juniors and therefore teaching the Crucible for about 15 years now. And I teach it every year, sometimes twice uh, a year with the semester system. So I've become fairly familiar with it, and I've really come to enjoy it. To the degree that people very often take it as a literal interpretation of what happened in the Salem Witch Trials, which of course it isn't. And he would be the first to admit that. Well, I think what Miller was interested in the Crucible was was not so much historical fact or historical accuracy as social commentary. Uh, 
Miller was writing a play in the midst of the Red Scare in America. His rationale for writing that play was to underscore a parallel between what was going on in the 50s with the McCarthy hearings and uh, what happened in the, in the Salem instance with people being accused wrongfully of something as horrible as, uh, as witchcraft. And if you look at McCarthyism, I, I think you'll see the same thing, what you have going on in American society as well. Certainly, it's after a major war, World War II. And you have this new ideological war beginning, um, this redefining of what America is and what America stands for. When someone like Arthur Miller writes The Crucible, and he takes Reverend Hale as the composite minister of the time, and that kind of projects that name out to the uh, public so that they now see him as in this role that is uh, probably not correct. Miller's portrayal of Hale, like, like the play itself, was, uh, was geared toward larger issues. Uh, Hale helped him achieve his larger agenda. Reverend Hale is one of the chief characters, and he's supposed to be the learned man who has uh, read all about witchcraft and so forth, and he's given probably a little more power than he actually had uh, in the examinations themselves. Reverend John Hale is one of those very important characters in the play who uh, stands out as a voice of reason, especially at a point where things begin to fall apart and says, you know, maybe we need to rethink our position in this. He comes to see that What's going on is a travesty of justice. He uh, follows his own individual conscience. He shows some courage. He quits the proceedings. He leaves the court uh, at the end of Act Three. Our Hale was a different kind of man. He made him a witch hunter. He put him in Salem Village, where Hale would never have gone because he was not the minister, and that was Paris's territory, or Nicholas Noyes's territory, or someone else's territory, not his. And he would not have been in the situation that Miller put him in. Despite the historical inaccuracies of Miller's play, The Crucible has gone on to become a great classic in American drama. During the tercentenary of the trials in 1992, Arthur Miller was invited to Salem and surrounding communities to remember the incidents which occurred 300 years earlier, as well as the events which have occurred since then. Every generation suffers through some kind of a witch hunt in which rational people, because of their fears, because of their misunderstanding of events, uh, do irrational things and begin striking out at, at the, the portion of society which is, is different than them. The town of Danvers built a memorial to commemorate the lives of the executed victims of Salem's witchcraft trials. We have town land right across the street from where the original meeting house of 1692 was located and we thought that was an excellent place to put a memorial. And we didn't do it for the tourist trade. We did it so finally the town of Danvers Old Salem Village would confront its ghosts and uh, uh, acknowledge the mistakes of the past and how individuals in society can in fact be better than the society in which they live. The legacy of 1692 Salem is perhaps best remembered through the perspectives of the accused. But how has history judged those who took part in it? How has history judged Reverend John Hale? He should be remembered as a man who helped Beverly become a town, who brought a divided village together, who 